Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. Je suis extrêmement heureux de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour une nouvelle conférence virtuelle du CDTS et du projet Equality. I am delighted to welcome you today for a new CLTS virtual event co-hosted with the Equality Project. For those who don't know me, my name is Florian Martin Barito. I am an associate professor of law and the university research chair in technology and society at the University of Ottawa, where I lead the Center for Law, Technology and Society. For today's virtual talk, we are delighted to partner with the Equality Project, a seven-year shirk funded research partnership, hosted at the Center, for a virtual book launch of the Emerald Handbook of Technology Facilitated Violence and Abuse, co-edited by Jane Bailey, um, Ashley Finn, and Nicola Henry, who will be animating this virtual book launch across many time zones. Uh, Jane Bailey is a full professor in the Faculty of Law Common Law section at the University of Ottawa, a CLTS a faculty member, and co-leads the Equality Project uh, housed here at the Centre. Asher Flynn is an Associate Professor of Criminology in the School of Social Sciences at Monash University and Vice President of the Australian and New Zealand Society of Criminology. And Nicola Henry is an Associate Professor and Vince, Vice Chancellor's Principal Research Fellow in the Social and Global Studies Centre at RMIT University in Melbourne in Australia. And uh, the book that we're launching today, this inter international book, features over 40 multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary scholars, practitioners, advocates, survivors, and technologists from 17 countries, and addresses a wide spectra spectrum of abuse per perpetrated online, offline, and through new technologies. And without further ado, Further ado, sorry, I will hand it over to my colleague, Prof. Jane Bailey, who, with other co editors and some of their contributors, will present you this important handbook. Prof. Bailey, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Florian. And welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Um, I know in, a, in an international handbook with um, folks from so many um, jurisdictions around the world. Um, there was not really an obviously great um, convenient time for everyone to meet. So I'm really grateful for those who could join us um, and, and thankful to the authors who are going to be presenting and also the, the other authors that I see um, in the in the list of attendees. I really uh, we really appreciate your your support. Um, it's a real pleasure to to launch a book that was really a glint in the eyes of Asher, Nicola, and me um, after a conference that we presented at um, in Australia back in I think 2018, um, and uh, to sort of see the 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 project finally come to fruition of a of an international interdisciplinary intersectoral collection is is really uh, wonderful. Um, especially considering um, that we were navigating the throes of a, of a, a pandemic and still continue to do that in um, in getting this in getting this book to publication. Um, we'll have other thank yous at the end, but I, I especially wanted to acknowledge and thank uh, Dr. Ann Chung from Hong Kong University, whose gracious contribution from her Hong Kong research grant made it possible for this book to be um, freely available online and open access. Um, and so I invite um, all of you who haven't have, had a chance to, to, to take a look um, online and perhaps we can provide the, uh, I know the link was in the invitation online, but uh, maybe we can provide the link in the chat again as well. Um, just the order of proceeding for today, um, Nicola is going to kick us off with an overview of the book and, and its seven sections and talk a bit about our, our working definition of tech facilitated violence. And then we'll have um, presentations uh, from six of the seven sections of the book um, uh, from the authors and co-authors of, of, of chapters in each of the sections. Um, and then we're going to open it up for a question and answer period, and we invite you to post your questions um, in the chat. 
And with that, I will I will turn it over to uh, to my co-editor and, and dear friend Nicola Henry. Um, thank you so much, Jane. It's so lovely to um, be here with all, all of you today. Um, today I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people. I pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including the elders past, present and emerging. I'm going to spend the next 10 or so minutes giving you an overview of the handbook. I'll go through the seven different sections which contain the chapters from our world leading experts on the topic of technology facilitated violence and abuse. Now, just so you know, technology facilitated violence and abuse is quite a mouthful to say, so I probably might just abbreviate that um, to technology um, or tech facilitated abuse. So let me start with the first section of the handbook. The first section of the handbook, um, I might just share my screen with you because it will show you which chapters are in each of the um, of the section of the, the seven different sections of the book. Hopefully you can see that OK. Um, so the first section um, looks at a spectrum of behaviours that make up technology facilitated violence and abuse. The purpose of this first uh, section is to give the reader a good grounding on the key concepts and the critical debates on this topic. Authors discuss the false dichotomy between online and offline experiences. They, they explore the term violence and whether this is the right way to capture the diverse and complex experiences and behaviours which make up the phenomenon of technology facilitated abuse. The authors in this section also discuss the nature of harms involving the use of digital technologies. They problematise the compartmentalisation and separation of tech facilitated abuse with other forms, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of interpersonal harms. And they insist that tech facilitated abuse must be examined in light of a continuum of sexual violence against women or as an intersection of settler colonialism with misogyny that shapes the lived experiences of violence and abuse in the ways in which people are able to seek support and help for these harms. Chapters in this first section also explore issues surrounding victimisation and perpetration in often neglected parts of the world, such as New Zealand and the sub-Saharan African region or than indigenous communities where people experience tech facilitated abuse differently because of settler colonialism. Moving on to section two of the handbook, uh, which is looking at text based harms. In this section, the authors recognise the diverse ways in which online speech acts can cause harm and constitute harm. And the harms being individual, collective, as well as intergenerational. The authors explore many underexplored issues, such as the vicious online attacks against women by other women, the problem of online threats to kill, rape or cause harm, the nature of transphobic discourse online, doxing and the intentional release of personal information on the internet, as well as antisocial comments on online forums. Many of the themes of section one of the handbook come up again here in this section, including the downplaying of harms in our legal system and also in our society more broadly. The authors also consider the interconnected nature of harms, the impacts and the significance of lived experiences of online hate that serve to stigmatise, delegitimise and exclude people and therefore undermine their rights to digital citizenship and their rights to be themselves online. In addition to exploring harms, authors in the second section also examine the underlying drivers of oppressive speech acts. They recognise that what drives individual and collectivities to engage in harmful speech acts online is complex. Indeed, none of the authors in the section treat online hate in, hate in simplistic or, or individualistic terms. Instead, they recognise the way in which offending individuals rationalise their behaviour among other like-minded people to shore up support and to provide further justification for their harmful acts. While the authors in this section examine the influence of broader structural factors, they do not lose sight of the agency and responsibility of the individuals behind the hate. Moving now to section three, which we uh, focus on image based harms. And again, I've just got that on the screen so you can see which chapters are in the section. We deliberately defined this rather broadly um, to refer to the creation or dissemination of image, images that denigrate or subjugate the person depicted in the image or which expose the viewer to vicarious trauma or affect. 
In other words, the authors in this section recognise that images can be harmful, not only for those depicted in the images, but also for those who are exposed to the viewing of those images. The chapters in this section are based on original empirical research on three important issues. First, exposure to abhorrent violent material. Second, violent or aggressive pornography use and exposure. And third, image-based sexual abuse. The authors explore the harms of images, how harms can be experienced, experienced differently for people of colour and other minority groups, and also how legislative interventions and prohibitions might not address the complexity of image-based harms. Together, the three chapters in this section provide a timely reminder of the enduring power of images that survive and linger in both space and time, which can have significant impact implications for both the subjects of the image as well as the spectators. Section four of the handbook explores the proliferation of image-based sexual abuse, sexual assault, and sexual harassment on dating apps. The authors recognize the different ways in which individuals from marginalized population experience harms and how socio-cultural and sexual norms facilitate, normalize, and excuse these harms. Similar to other authors in the handbook, the authors in this fourth section recognize the ways in which lived experiences of harms on dating applications are shaped by the dynamics of power and interlocking forms of social inequality on the grounds of race, gender, class and disability. The authors explore the experiences of people with diverse gender and sexual identities in using dating applications and experiencing sexual harms to consider how these may differ from heteronormative experiences. But the authors don't just focus on harms, they also examine the complexity of consent and the greyness of consent in some situations. They acknowledge the pleasures and benefits of online dating sites and applications, as well as the subcultural norms that shape the way in which certain groups, such as gay, queer and bisexual men, engage in their spaces. In section five, we highlight um, where we move to focusing on technology facilitated abuse in the context of domestic and family violence, as well as between intimate partners. The chapters in this section provide rich insights from survivors and from support practitioners and advocates. There's a focus on the double-edged sword of technology in both perpetuating and combating tech facilitated abuse. And similar to so many of the other chapters in this wonderful collection, the authors discuss the importance of an intersectional approach to gender-based violence. They note that the failure to take an intersectional approach is likely to result in policy and services that fail to meet the needs of women from the most marginalised communities. The chapters in this section help to address some of the existing gaps in the literature by giving voice to the lived experiences of women living in remote areas of Australia, those of advocates and practitioners supporting women experiencing domestic violence in Singapore, young women experiencing intimate partner violence in, in Brazil and Australia, as well as culturally and linguistically diverse women's experiences in the Australian context. Section six of the handbook explores the legal responses to different forms of technology facilitated abuse and violence. There are chapters in this section which focus specifically on legislative responses to the non-consensual disclosure of intimate images, deep fakes, drones, voyeurism and doxing. There are also chapters that look more broadly at the ways in which legislation in diverse countries of the world have introduced new legislation, or in some cases not introduced any laws at all, to combat tech facilitated abuse. The authors draw on local, regional or international human rights obligations which can provide a benchmark as well as a conceptual tool to examine different forms of tech facilitated abuse. For instance, as a privacy violation, as a denial of the right to freedom of expression and bodily integrity, as well as a violation of inherent dignity of the person. There's also consideration here in, this, in these chapters about the developments of law, as well as the judicial processes and how broader norms and attitudes about gender and sexuality shape courts, that shape the way in which courts interpret legislative, legislative provisions. And finally, the authors consider the quasi-legal role of government and non-governmental cyber safety organisations, which provide support to victim survivors, play an educative function, and in some cases administer new laws on tech facilitated abuse. Finally, section seven, um, we turn our attention to the responses beyond the law. 
We look at non-legal responses to tech facilitated abuse. The authors in this section recognise the limitations of legislative responses, which while important in playing an important communicative role, are not always effective in ensuring perpetrator accountability or victim vindication. These chapters acknowledge that laws alone are not sufficient to prevent, challenge or respond, and what is required is a multifaceted and collaborative approach that incorporates criminal and, criminal and civil justice laws, prevention education, as well as technological and other societal or community approaches. The chapters in the section explore innovative ways to respond to tech facilitated abuse, including tech design informed by a feminist ethics of care, multifaceted collaborations, hashtag activism campaigns, naming and shaming perpetrators, organizing rallies or demonstrations, training healthcare, legal and legal practitioners and other professionals, bystander intervention, and digital platforms doing more to detect, prevent and respond to tech facilitated abuse. And the authors in this section are clear in pointing out that the burden of preventing these harms should not fall on women and girls who are disproportionately affected by tech facilitated abuse. Several chapters in this section also point to the importance of multi-stakeholder and multi-perspective approaches to this issue. And they discuss the benefits and challenges of working across these different sectors. In summary, this handbook covers so much. It's been such a wonderful opportunity uh, to, to be a, a co-editor of this handbook. And I'd like to thank Jane um, for leading this wonderful collection and to all the authors who have contributed um, to, the, to, to make this handbook such a great success. The authors have done a, an incredible job of tackling the complexity of victimization, perpetration, responsibility, accountability, impacts and harms. And we conclude the collection by stating, technology facilitated violence and abuse is a truly global problem. As the diverse perspectives and experiences featured in this book have shown, the deep entanglement between technologies, inequality, marginalization, abuse and violence require multifaceted and collaborative responses that exist within and beyond the, the law. And we also conclude, and, and I'll end here to say that this handbook has been incubated and will be born into complex and chaotic times defined by historic global pandemics of disease, i.e. COVID-19, racism and misinformation. These are times in which the entanglements of social, cultural, economic, political and technological forces and lived experiences around the globe are undeniable. And where careful attention must be paid to the impacts of discriminatory systems such as misogyny, racism, homophobia, transphobia, colonialism, ableism, classism, and their intersections, as well as to perspectives beyond those of us situated in, industrial, in industrialized nations. Mindful of this context, it is in the spirit that we add this collection to the cacophony of voices calling for improved understanding of and responses to technology facilitated violence and abuse. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicola. Um, so now we're going to move on to the to the uh, to the second section of of the program that we were uh, planning to to get to today, um, and that is um, short uh, presentations from uh, six uh, from authors from six chapters uh, in the collection, um, and we're going to kick off with uh, uh, someone representing from section one. Um, tech facilitated violence uh, against uh, across a spectrum of behaviors and maybe Nicola before the next person starts you could stop stop your screen share and um, yeah and so the the first this first presenter is Dr. Shandell Goss I am delighted to to introduce her she is a postdoc researcher at Royal Roads University in Canada she's a very vital part of the equality project as well she'll be speaking on her chapter not the real world exploring experiences of online abuse digital dualism and ontological labor welcome Chandel. thank you so much uh, so yes my name is Chandel, um, and i just want to start with a big thank you to jane bailey asher flynn and nicola henry as well as other panelists tonight it's a pleasure and an honor to be speaking here 
So the chapter I contributed to this book is based on interviews I conducted with women who experienced online abuse, and it sets out to better understand the experiences of online abuse in the context of what some refer to as digital existence. So when I speak of digital existence, I'm referring to the way that online spaces have become a central part of the way we experience our social, our political, and our, and our economic and personal lives. Um, but despite the centrality, participants in my research identified a tendency to treat online spaces as less real, as less material, less harmful, and the people in them as less vulnerable. This tendency is called digital dualism, and it refers to the process of making and thinking a distinction between online and offline life. Digital dualism is a bias that sees preferential treatment given to offline forms of communication and interaction. And so in my chapter, um, I suggest that in addition to being a bias, digital dualism is also a discourse that produces a habit. And if you listen for it, you'll hear this habit play out all around you. You'll hear people use the terms like real life, online world, virtual reality. And the problem here is that when you say real life, you're referring to something else as unreal or less real. Acknowledging the discursive dimension of digital dualism is important because it helps us to think about how power is exercised through the language we use to talk about online and offline life. And while digitalist, uh, digital dualist thinking might not be intentional, the tendency to make the online offline distinction and to speak in those terms is pretty catchy. It spreads and becomes an existing convention, a kind of common sense that governs and legitimizes social relations. So in total throughout my interviews, the theme of digital dualism emerged in the interviews in three ways. First, as advice from others to turn off the computer, delete social media and block users. So for example, one participant, and names have been changed, of course, um, one participant, Ellie, explained, quote, a big frustration for me is when I tell people about the problems I'm having and they just say, well, you should stop using social media altogether. You should delete your Instagram, you should delete your Facebook, you should just stop. As Ellie explained, quote, getting offline is not always an option. And even if it was, such advice wrongly assumes that no longer seeing the abuse somehow renders it less harmful. Secondly, digital dualism manifested as a denial of online abuse as real. Participants described encounters where their abuse was doubted, downplayed, or ignored by therapists, friends, teachers, and perpetrators as well. For example, Trish described comments she received where perpetrators tried to deny her the space to understand their actions as abuse. She explained that after confronting a man who shared her image without consent, the perpetrator became defensive. Quote, he said, go think of something in the real world. And I said, hey, just because it's online doesn't mean it's not the real world. And he said something like, stop telling yourself that. Third, digital dualism was internalized by participants themselves. So the phrases like real world and real life were frequently used by participants to describe offline experiences. This uh, demonstrates, I think, the pervasive nature of this discursive habit. For example, Lily used the term to point out that perpetrators of online abuse should face the same consequences as they would with other kinds of abuse. She said, quote, I feel like they deserve to be treated just as if they'd hurt me physically, like in real life. These findings are symptomatic of a culture that privileges face-to-face -face communication over digital communication. While perpetrators' belief that online abuse is less injurious and less consequential to those targeted is self-serving because it deflects responsibility, it also reflects a wider hierarchy of harm that has long circulated in offline spaces where forms of abuse without physical markers are invisibilized. This is evident in the types of advice participants received, which assumes that the abuse and harm can be turned off as easily as the devices themselves, as if the abuse is localized to the screen before us, rather than something that sits with us or that we carry effectively throughout our day. But perhaps the most dangerous aspect of digital dualism is that it has become so commonplace to think in this way. And when digital dualism is naturalized, it further erases the harm of online abuse because it hijacks an important process of recognition and leaves targets of abuse doing the work of convincing others and sometimes convincing themselves that the harm they experienced matters and is real. Thank you. I look forward to question and answer period. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shandell. Um, that's terrific. We're going to continue in our rapid fire way. Um, 
we we won't have someone from section two as i mentioned uh dr uh, emma jane was unable to join us uh today so we're going to move to section three um, which focuses on image-based harms and we've got dr samantha keen a lecturer at the school of social and cultural studies at victoria university of wellington new zealand welcome samantha uh, kia ora koutou, everyone. Um, I'm hoping that I can be seen on the screen at your end. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Dr. Samantha Keane and I'm a lecturer in criminology uh, at the School of Social and Cultural Studies uh, in Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, firstly, I just want to extend a massive thank you uh, to Jane Bailey, Asha Flynn and Nicola Henry uh, for the opportunity to be able to contribute a chapter to uh, this fantastic edited collection, which I think demonstrates the importance of um, recognising the negative harms associated with uh, technology facilitated violence and abuse, um, but also really sets the scene for feminist engagement uh, in this area. And so uh, the chapter that I contributed uh, to the book is called Just Fantasy, Online Pornography's Contribution to Experiences of Harm. Now, this chapter was inspired from my doctoral research, which I completed at the end of 2019. And in my doctoral research, I spoke with 24 uh, 18 to 30 year olds living in Aotearoa, New Zealand, about the ways in which they felt that contemporary mainstream pornography uh, had affected their experiences in life in both positive and in negative ways. And so the chapter was inspired from uh, those conversations. Uh, and really set the scene for me in terms of understanding the ways in which violent depictions of uh, sexually explicit content available on mainstream pornography tube sites, such as Pornhub, can largely shape the ways in which viewers understand the, the natural sexual order, if you like. So the ways in which our sexual scripts function, how we understand sex to be, who sex is for, and how sex is performed, and how people respond during particular uh, acts occurring during sex. So I spoke with 11 women and 13 men, uh, and these conversations were, were diverse, uh, they were varied, and they were very subjective. So uh, it obviously is, is impossible to draw generalizations uh, from the data uh, that uh, is presented in the chapter, but I think it provides a unique snapshot into a period of time uh, where this is, perhaps the first generation that has grown up with significant exposure to contemporary internet pornography. And we know that the content of internet pornography today differs largely from the, the nude images of various states of undress, if you like, that previously graced uh, the pages of Playboy magazine. So contemporary mainstream pornography now fuses sex with aggression, in much of contemporary content. Uh, this is not to say that all pornography is representative of aggressive sexual conduct, but pornography does have a mainstream and that is freely available uh, to a lot of people uh, and engaged with in immense volumes. So for example, in 2019, Pornhub reported that they had 42 billion site visits. What I found through discussions with men and women about how they understood what pornography was, was that they very much recognised that aggression in pornography was omnipresent. It was something that they were constantly faced with. And so they were really able to identify that uh, misogyny, uh, sexism, racism and aggression was almost a, a mainstay, if you like, of contemporary pornographic content. But in terms of speaking to the ways in which harms were experienced from viewing such content, it was a very gendered response that I encountered with men and women. So for example, uh, what came through in conversations with men was a recognition that managing and navigating uh, appropriate or 
um, normal volumes of pornography viewing, if for want of a better word, normal, um, meant that some men struggled with maintaining those levels and, and felt addicted. Uh, I like to trouble the word addicted, but that was the word that they used. And that it had shaped their ideas about human sexuality and particular sexual behaviours such as forceful oral sex. And so what I noticed came through as a mirror, if you like, with the women that I spoke with was they certainly felt that the way that um, men engaged with pornography had shaped the way that they related to them as women. So some of the women that I spoke with talked about pornography being used as a tool for grooming and sexual coercion in intimate relationships. Uh, pornography was used as, as a mechanism for encouraging particular types of sexual behaviours to be engaged in. And because of the wider persisting gender double standards that exist in relation to sex, um, women felt that it was particularly difficult to express interest in pornography and concerns that their interest in pornography would result in real life consequences. So while pornography can be a powerful sexual aid and an outlet for sexual pleasure, it can also be a playful addition to couple relationships. The excerpts that I included in the chapter demonstrate that pornography can be simultaneously pleasurable and liberatory, but also harmful. And I think it's important that we continue to recognize the potential harmful influence of pornography on the lives of not just young people, but also adults. Thank you very much, Samantha. Um, next, we have uh, speaking for, about his chapter from section four on dating applications. We have Dr. Chris Dietzel, um, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Dalhousie University here in Canada, speaking on his chapter that straight up rape culture manifestations of rape culture on Grinder. I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Thank you, Jane. I'm going to be sharing my screen for this. So hopefully you can all see this. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Chris Dietzel, he, him. I'm a postdoctoral fellow uh, at Dalhousie University in Halifax, which is on the east coast of Canada. Uh, before I begin, I do want to just say a big thank you to Jane Bailey, Asher Flynn, and Nicola Henry for this opportunity to publish and now today to share my work. Uh, specifically, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Henry, uh, as I worked with her the most. Uh, so Nicola, I really want to say thank you because I learned so much from you uh, through the process of, of revisions and everything. Um, feedback, which I have incorporated in my own mentorship uh, and support that I now give to my students. So thank you for that. So my research explores the intersections of sexuality, gender, safety, consent and technology. And um, similar to the previous presenter, my research project came out of my uh, dissertation project that I did for my PhD. And so today what I'm doing is I'm sharing you sharing with you findings from the qualitative study I conducted where I investigated, <clears throat> excuse me, 25 men who have sex with men. So MSM, 25 MSMs experiences with dating apps. Um, and so I've included my Twitter on the lower uh, part of the screen. So feel free to at me if you want to talk about these issues further or uh, get in touch with me. To begin, I, I want to share what uh, some of the participants explained were examples of rape culture on dating apps. So first, participants talked about problematic user behavior as a manifestation of rape culture. So they talked about someone making assumptions about they want, about um, like the, the types of uh, assumptions that they would make about their consent or wanting to interact. Participants also talked about uh, assumptions made about their sexual interests. Uh, which they said people discerned from the profile text and images that they had on their dating app profiles. They also talked about uh, people pressuring them online to engage in online sexual behavior. So they talked about coercive, coaxing, harassing, different types of behavior that we can we identify as technology facilitated violence and abuse. Uh, there were also participants who specifically talked about uh, online uh, app users not taking no for an answer and specifically for ra uh, for racialized M uh, MSM, they talked about being fetishized online. 
In terms of messages and images specifically, participants talked about uh, users who are aggressive, invasive, imposing, violent, objectifying. Uh, objectifying. They talked about non-consensual receipt of images, such as unsolicited dick pics, uh, which is an issue that I actually explore in another uh, recent publication, which is called The Three Dimensions of Unsolicited Dick Pics. They also talked about not just the non-consensual receipt of images, but the non-consensual sharing of images, uh, which is colloquially known as revenge porn. And so one participant actually said that the sharing of pictures uh, without someone's consent is straight up rape culture. Participants also talked about sexual violence that they experienced from app users uh, in real life. Uh, to problematize that term that uh, another um, presenter discussed. But yeah, they did They did talk about sexual violence that they had experienced uh, from folks they connected with online and then met in person. And so they talked about uh, concerns about someone like using the geolocating function to find out where they live, feeling pressure to engage in sexual, sexual activity when meeting in person, about the expectations that sex happens without clarifying or confirming consent. They talked about non-consensual sexual experiences specifically, such as such as forced oral sex. Uh, and one participant actually talked about sex that was not bad enough to stop. Uh, there were others who, one participant who talked about someone who, like online, did not take no for an answer and uh, reported that they almost called the cops. And actually one participant disclosed that he had been raped twice. There was one participant who actually uh, disclosed that he was a perpetrator of technology facilitated sexual violence uh, and said that he was actually sexually violent with a casual sex partner that he only experienced afterwards. So these are just some of the few examples that demonstrate uh, how MSM can both be victims and perpetrators of technology facilitated sexual violence. And so while there's many, many more things that I could share, uh, which I'll be happy to go about uh, discussing in the question and answer period, or you know, if you want to read my chapter, uh, but just a couple of things that I want to highlight to close is that participants explained that some apps enable rape culture more than others. For instance, on Tinder, you have to swipe right in order to match with somebody to interact, whereas on Grindr, you're presented with a grid where you can message anybody at any time. So the affordances of the apps actually can enable rape culture, uh, some enabling it more than others. Participants also talked about how the affordances, similarly, how the affordances can not only facilitate, but how they can also hinder rape culture. And so in online interactions, there's uh, there's online tools such as blocking and reporting that can actually make it easier to, to block someone uh, or report someone who is engaged in harassing or violent behavior. These affordances, of course, would not be available in person. So in some ways, online spaces can make it safer, uh, even though rape culture still exists online. And lastly, I want to I want to state that participants did recognize uh, that rape culture is not the fault of apps, rather that it is present everywhere in society. And apps, just like online spaces or bars or cafes or anywhere else, can be a, a, a space where sexual violence is present. And so they recognize this, and while they would like to see more, uh, and I argue that apps do need to do more, uh, it's not necessarily the apps' fault, uh, but sexual violence is present in society. And so with that, I will close. Uh, so again, thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, and I look forward to this discussion uh, and the other presentations. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm going to I'm going to turn it over now to Nicola to introduce our next speaker. Um, thank you, Jane. Um, our next speaker is Associate Professor Bridget Harris. Um, Bridget is an ARC DECRA Fellow at uh, Queensland University of Technology, and alongside her co-author, Dr. Delaney Woodlock, her chapter is entitled Digital Coercive Control and Spatiality, Rural, Regional and Remote Women's Experiences. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you so much to all of the editors for all of your work and to everybody who worked on this amazing text. I want to just begin by acknowledging that I'm on Turrbal and Yagra lands and to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. So my fabulous colleague Delaney Woodlock and I explore in our chapter what we've termed digital coercive control. So what we're looking at is how technology is weaponized by perpetrators of domestic violence. We're considering the method, which is digital. We're thinking about the intent, which is coercive behavior, and the impact, which is controlling a current or former partner really to entrap somebody. 
what we argue is that digital coercive control is not divorced from other forms of offline, if you like, harm. It's often used to enact things like financial, emotional, psychological, sexual abuse. It can be used to facilitate in-person stalking, but there are also unique digital forms and we could think about things like doxing, for instance. So we offer a definition and we do talk about some of the behaviours that might be identified, but really emphasise that perpetrator strategies and actions are individualised. So they're shaped to target a particular victim survivor. This means that things like calling at a certain time or using a certain word in text messages can be harmful or hurtful because of the meaning it carries and the setting in which it occurs. Similarly, we're trying to think about behaviours and technologies that victim survivors might flag, but other people outside of the relationship might see these as normal or legitimate or benign. So sharing your location with your partner, for instance, might be something people feel really comfortable doing. It might make your life easier when you're arranging things. It might make you feel safer. But that expectation or demand or practice of tracking someone's movements and activities has a very different intent and meaning in an abusive relationship. So what we're really emphasising is we need to be thinking about the context in which this tech abuse occurs, this digital coercive control. And that means that we're looking not at isolated instances, but at these behaviours as part of broader patterns of coercive control, which really serve to limit somebody's freedoms. We talk about this as spaceless violence, and that's because someone can be exposed anytime they or the perpetrator are accessing a device or digital profile or app, for example. But we really do need to be thinking about place and space to try and understand both how digital coercive control presents, but also the impacts and responses. So drawing on work we completed with women victim survivors in regional, rural and remote Australia, what we found is that it's not the forms of digital coercive control that differ between urban and non-urban locations, but what really does change is the experience, the impacts and, and then what happens when someone's experiencing those harms. So we think firstly about place, which is geographic locations. We also consider space, and that's really what is happening in a particular place at a certain time. And it's shaped by a number of different factors. So who is in that space? Things like the community makeup, the values, the ideologies, the power structures that are occurring. Thinking about place, we know that women in non-urban locations have really exacerbated barriers when they're trying to seek assistance and response support when responding to violence. They're more visible than in smaller communities. And this is especially true for women who are seen as or identify as other, if they're culturally and linguistically diverse, women with disabilities, criminalised women, for example. They might be both socially and also geographically isolated. Uh, services and resources can be really limited in non-urban locations. In that kind of setting, technology can be a great tool for overcoming isolation, but when it's weaponised by perpetrators, it can result in informal and formal channels of support being cut. We can think about space too. So we might think about gender in rural places and where traditional gender roles might be instilled and rural masculinities might manifest quite differently than in urban settings. Women in close, neat, small, sometimes conservative in their words communities were sometimes encouraged to resolve what was framed as conflict as opposed to domestic violence, to maintain the family structure, not to go against the boys club of which the perpetrator was part, the abuser's network of supporters. So essentially, while we're studying this spaceless violence, we are arguing that you can't overlook the setting in which women, perpetrators, and also services are based. We need to be acknowledging that both place and space really shape experiences and responses to digital coercive control. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, next up, we have Sinead Stevenson. Sinead is a Scottish lawyer and lecturer in law at Glasgow Caledonian University. Um, alongside her co-author, Sarai Chisala Templehoff, Sarai is a Malawi Malawian human rights lawyer and legal researcher. Uh, she is the founder and executive director of the Gender and Justice Unit in Malawi. Their, type, uh, their chapter is titled Image-Based Sexual Abuse, a Comparative Analysis of Criminal Law Approaches in Scotland and Malawi. Thank you, Nicola. Um, good evening and, and thank you, everyone. And I suppose just to begin by echoing what everyone's already 
said um, a, a big thank you to the editors um, for allowing my, myself and, and Sarai to contribute to this work, but also for the incredibly um, nurturing way this handbook um, came into being. It was a difficult time during the pandemic um, and yeah, I really couldn't have asked for a more supportive um, collegiate editorial team to be working with. It was a real privilege, um, so thank you for that. Um, so as um, we, we um, said earlier, this chapter was a comparative approach between um, image-based sexual abuse laws in Scotland and in Malawi, um, thinking specifically, I suppose, about the crime that we would maybe think of colloquially as, as revenge porn. Um, when we started working on this um, research together, Scotland had not long brought in legislation designed to, to tackle um, sharing of, of intimate images. Before that, it could be prosecuted under a variety of, of, of crimes uh, in the criminal law, but there was no bespoke um, uh, offence that would deal with this crime. And that was seen as a problem and a problem that was legislated for. Um, and from the perspective of us as, as co-authors having reviewed that legislation, we would say that it's actually, um, it's a very good example of, of legislation in this area. It's really, um, it's well drafted, it's very comprehensive. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, for example, it covers threats to disclose intimate images, not just um, the actual disclosure. And we've actually seen a number of prosecutions in Scotland around the, the threat to disclose. And that's significant because that often feeds into a pattern of um, coercive controlling behaviour and um, domestic violence. Um, so the, the fact that the legislation actually also deals with threats is a, is a good example of how it's comprehensive. Um, it's also comprehensive in the sense that it includes images which have been altered. So, um, for example, if a victim's head is put onto another's body, that would still be covered by the legislation. So on paper, it is a very, very good piece of legislation. And I think something that interested us both was that the reason the legislation is, is so good, um, why it's comprehensive and indeed why it exists in the first place, um, was because of sustained campaigning by the women's sector in Scotland to actually make this happen, to legislate in this space. Um, and for example, Scottish Women's Aid, um, you know, many years before the, the legislation came into being, you know, I think about four or five years before, created two websites, one of which was called um, Stop Revenge Porn Scotland, which was about sharing information about what the crime or what the, the behaviours were, um, highlighting the ways in which they could support victims. And they had another site, a Flickr site, um, which was image based, which is about people being able to show their support for victims of the crime. Um, so there'd been real sustained campaigning work by the women's sector in Scotland. And that was significant. We really owe them a lot for the reason why this legislation is, is so good. And I think that that was one of the key messages that I wanted to flag from the, the Scottish side of things is that there are currently some concerns in Scotland that it's a very good piece of legislation, but we're maybe not seeing the numbers of prosecution that we hope to, to see. Um, and I suppose that what we need to remember is that for this to be a success in practice, we need to remember where it came from. And it came from um, that real collaborative working um, between justice partners, not just lawyers, prosecutors in the kind of criminal justice system. It was a much wider piece of work um, that involved strategic campaigning and collaboration across sectors. Um, and that was coming from the, the Scottish perspective. And I think that really echoed with um, Sarai's experience as, a, as an activist and a lawyer in, in Malawi. Um, I'll hand over to you to Sarai to, to talk about Malawi. Thank you so much, Sinead. And um, I just want to echo the thanks to the editors, to Jane Bailey, Asher Flynn and Nicola Henry for the opportunity to participate and contribute to what is an incredible piece of, of scholarship. And I, I think it's incredibly in, uh, important that it's available um, open source. That means so much, especially coming from somewhere like Malawi where you don't always have access to um, paid for journals and um, other sources of information. So this really means a lot to me that um, our work is a part of this, um, of this handbook. So just to echo what Shane was saying, I think it was really important for us when we were doing our work to compare how 
being part of or coming from feminist roots or a feminist activism or a movement um, really had an impact on the way that the bespoke legislation played out in Scotland, as opposed to Malawi, where we don't have any bespoke offenses uh, relating to image-based sexual abuse or technology facilitated um, violence and abuse. Instead, we have a number of options in existing pieces of legislation and newer pieces of legislation, but none of which have actually been used um, to protect women as they claim to have been created for. Instead, and I think a previous speaker talked about weaponization, but in the case of Malawi specifically, the weaponization has been from the state um, and other stronger forces using pieces of legislation that are about cyberbullying, cyber harassment to respond to um, freedom of speech um, and really like uh, push back from private individuals. So there is definitely an institutional resistance to supporting victims and to taking these kinds of offenses seriously. And particularly we see that from the police. And I've seen this in my work as an activist um, in assisting uh, victims of IBSA in their attempts to find some sort of justice for the experiences that they have had um, online and offline. And the first thing has been that the police will demand that a victim comes forward. But what we know so far in working in this kinds of spaces is that victims want to be forgotten. But I think the reality of the internet is that you just, you, you cannot be forgotten. So my organization, for example, is trying to work to shift the cultural attitudes around IBSA. I think a big thing that we have seen in Malawi as opposed to Scotland is that there's a lot of vitriol pushback and slut shaming to use the, the, the commonly known terminology when it comes to victims of IBSA who have the audacity to come forward. I think women and girls in particular are judged for their nudity being exposed to so many people as opposed to being seen as the victims that they are. So a key message for, from the Malawian perspective um, is that even though the legislative landscape is quite diff different, for us as lawyers, it is not enough to just deal with the legal system. Um, there's a lot of cultural change, a lot of uh, perspective and attitude and belief systems that need to be um, addressed before we see these laws actually resulting in real or lasting change in the lives of victims and survivors of this extremely nuanced, extremely, um, uh, I don't know, devastating uh, type of crimes. Um, but anyways, I'm looking forward to hearing so much more from the rest of the authors. This is an incredible opportunity. I really enjoy being here tonight. Thank you so much. Um, it's unbelievable. We are exactly on time to the schedule. Um, we now have um, our final um, speaker, um, Associate Professor Alison Marganski. Alison is the Director of Criminology at Le Moyne College in Searcross, I um, probably pronounced that wrong, um, in New York, and her co-author is Associate Professor Lisa Melanda. And their chapter is titled Technology Facilitated Violence Against Women and Girls in Public and Private Spaces, Moving from Enemy to Ally. Hi everyone, thanks for having me here today uh, to speak. I'm grateful to be here and to have had the opportunity to contribute to this amazing international handbook that includes so many outstanding contributors and contributions. So when I initially heard about the call for proposals, I grew excited about the many possibilities for topics that I could write about, but also really overwhelmed and disheartened by how much gender violence there still is. There's so much to talk about and there's so much work that needs to be done to move towards more of a just and compassionate socio-technological socio environment. So I drafted several ideas and I was fortunate to have one of them gain acceptance. And I began working on this independently and I was a little fed up or should I say fueled by how many women and girls were still experiencing gender violence, even when narrowing it down to tech facilitated gender violence, which actually is quite common and uh, includes different types of victimization, ranging from cyberbullying and online harassment to upskirting to cyber stalking and abuse with home surveillance systems to engage in coercive control and so on. So as such, I wanted to highlight some of the ways that women and girls are being harmed in our highly digitized interconnected and global society and consider the structures that keep that in place. As I ended up reflecting on some of these issues, namely the complex and varied manifestations of violence against women and girls, 
uh, the prevalence of these experiences, poly victimization, the resulting harms and consequences, as well as the challenges that many face navigating life in the aftermath of trauma and also experiencing obstacles to justice, in, uh, including those related to healing, recovery, and building resilience. Uh, I was in awe at how many uh, brave individuals ended up taking action in response to their victimization. And that often uh, stemmed from their justice needs not being met. I also recognize that uh, social support is really vital to so many survivors. And it's often through the care and concern of others through collective efforts that we can feel less alone, we can understand more, and we can work together to contemplate solutions in a way that really improves justice. So I thought it would be really appropriate to invite my longtime colleague uh, to join me with this particular collaboration and to reflect not only on the dark side that we commonly focus on in our fields, but also to bring attention to these little rays of light uh, that shine through. So we wanted to focus on how women and girls ended up being empowered or, or taking uh, action into their own hands to have their justice needs met and also consider how others can or should uh, potentially help to create cultural change that can provide us with more of a safe space. So the goal of the chapter essentially was for us uh, to focus, again, not only on harms, but to spotlight how uh, strong, courageous, and innovative so many women and girls are, and to consider what we can do to create better environments for them. So we ended up reviewing some cases where women and girls have fought for and obtained justice when their needs have not been met or when others failed them. And we reviewed the roles of others in creating uh, well-being and safety. So essentially, we took a look at these alternate systems of justice and pathways to it that offered a voice to those who for far too long have been silenced in many ways. Uh, we ended up looking at how they've countered transgressions, held perpetrators accountable, such as through reposting some of the posts to their the perpetrating party's mother's Facebook page, or uh, we looked at how they may have protected others from violence, including explicitly naming offenders. So we see that there's many different ways technology can be used, and DIY justice online was also something that we paid attention to, as well as organized speakouts. Ha hashtag activism, uh, other safe spaces, and groups that have been created to try to battle sexism, misogyny, and other problems that we, we are seeing um, through technology. So we really focused on cultural change from technology and software en engineers and regenerative technologies that focus on kindness and empathy and healthy interactions to healthcare services that may recognize technology facilitated violence as a form of violence and engage with uh, screening tools as well as assistance that can help those who have been harmed, uh, the legal field and implementing laws that signal the un unacceptability of violence against women and girls, uh, educators and raising awareness and more. So in short, we really focused on how we all have a role to play, but we wanted to, um, point out really that we need an inclusive and culturally appropriate uh, solutions for uh, moving forward and to examine what works best. So in other words, providing this continuum of care to individuals through multiple institutions uh, to create safer spaces and places for, for women and girls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, Jane, did you want to introduce the next section or would you like me to? You can go ahead. Okay, no worries. Well, we're, we're um, I think we're up to the moderated discussion and the Q&A. Is that right, Jane? Um, okay, so we're now going to open um, to the floor um, and to see if anyone's got any questions for the contributors of the handbook or to, to Jane and I as editors as well. So feel free to turn your camera on um, and unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question or if you're too shy, um, feel free to go ahead and put your question in the chat.
I'll also invite the the speakers to turn their cameras on as well for the for the discussion part of this. And if you want, you can also, um, if you want to, um, just raise your hand um, if you're not familiar with Microsoft Teams. Um, there's just a little yellow hand that you can raise if you want to ask a question or make a comment. Maybe I'll kick off with a question. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, I might just start with uh, talking about um, some of the key challenges in, in, in doing research in this field. I know many of you have discussed these through your presentations and also in your um, in your book chapters as well. But I'm just wondering if you could um, just just give us an idea about what you see as the kind of key challenge of doing research on technology facilitated abuse and violence. Maybe we'll start with Chris. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy to get, kick it off. I, I you know, um, so one thing particularly with my research, looking at dating apps, uh, and being um, a queer man who uh, you know is interested in other queer men, um, this it my social location, my positionality uh, was actually a bit challenging in conducting the research in ways that I did not expect. Um, not so much that I was like. Uh, I didn't receive any outright violence or anything, but nonetheless, I did receive a bit of uh, abuse or harassment just uh, by people misunderstanding the kind of work that I do. So um, as I was recruiting participants, I had uh, one participant when I asked, like, where would you like to do our interview? Would you like to be in a cafe or in the library, etc.? He's like, oh, you can just come over and we can do it from my bedroom, um, which, of course, was inappropriate. Um, and so I was like, no, you're misunderstanding what the point of my research is. So no, thank you. You don't need to be a participant. Um, and then I had another participant who actually like uh, part who uh, I had another person who was actually participating in my research. And uh, well, actually, two. one who at the end of the interview, uh, I asked him if he had any questions for me. And he said, no, you're just really cute. Wink. And this this particular interview was online and sent like a winking emoji. And I was like, OK, we need to stop there. Uh, and then there was a, this third person who weeks after uh, actually found me on dating apps and messaged and was like, oh, you know, you might remember me. We did an interview a few weeks ago for your research. I was interested if you wanted to go farther. And that one to me is less harassment or anything. You know, it, once the study is done, you know, that's that's an individual's choice. Uh, but I actually wrote about this in my dissertation. And I think for people, I, I don't know if this speaks to the rest of the, the panelists and authors, but uh, conducting research on technology facilitated sexual violence, technology facilitated violence, and being a member or being someone who uses these technologies, uh, I think in terms of the methodologies and uh, the implications of being a researcher in this field, uh, that's something that I, I think needs to be understood. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that, Chris. Does anyone else want to comment on their experiences of doing research? Um, Sam, I, I can see you've got your you're nodding your head. <laughs> Curious to hear about um, you know some of your experience of doing research around pornography. Yeah, I very much um, had some. Uh, I mean, my experiences were different. Uh, but what I found doing research around pornography, particularly taking a critical stance in the sense that I could recognise both the pleasures and, and the pains, if you like, of pornography for people, and, and that was the title of my dissertation in the end, um, it very much gave me a blemished research identity. Um, so it was almost as if my study in pornography said something about who I was as an individual, which opened me up to quite a lot of abuse, uh, gendered abuse and harassment. Um, and I also experienced that uh, from women in particular, in the sense that it was sort of the, the wrong thing for a woman to be doing research in this space. And I was perceived to be a threat to intimate relationships, um, but also in the academy as well. Um, my research was trivialized uh, and delegitimized and seen as not uh, worthy of um, academic inquiry. Uh, and experienced harassment and abuse at conferences, unfortunately, from male participants, um, professors in, in fields around deviant behaviours. 
Uh, and I, I managed to write uh, an article on sexualities, um, uh, essentially detailing that whole experience about becoming a sex sexademic, if you like, um, and looking at pornography research and, and critical sex research, um, looking at violence as well as a form of dirty work. Um, so the stigmas associated with violence generally and, and victimisation um, being transferred to people doing the research as well. Has, has that deterred you in any way or has it just encouraged you to, to continue doing the amazing work that you're doing? Uh, very much encouraged me um, and I think what has been really helpful as well is it's very much now that I'm in a lecturing position um, and supervising students doing work in difficult spaces being able to identify the supports that will be needed um, and just really opening up space for discussions about some of those hard aspects of doing sex research that um, were not always there um, in some of the spaces I was I was running in during my doctoral research. Shandell? Um, thanks for sharing your experiences. Uh, I guess the only thing that I would add, um, but like Chris, I should say that I, I I didn't even, I forgot about it until he started talking about his experience um, about uh, my online recruitment tool was trolled. Um, and uh, I remember paper posters in the library on my campus uh, were defamed. Um, but I'm thinking of, you know, my research in general, uh, which is also the chapter is um, a component of my dissertation. I spoke with women who experienced pretty, like, in some cases, very severe forms of online abuse. And some were talking about previous experiences. Some were in the middle of, of dealing with some pretty horrific experiences. Um, but I was speaking with them about a pretty barren support landscape. and them like you know they mentioned moments of validation by speaking with me and having their experiences um, heard and uh, and validated in that sense but they often were looking for help and support themselves when the very nature of our discussion was about how little support exists for them or that they can't access support um, and there was always a limitation I think or a challenge of having to explain to them the slow pace of academic research um, and, you know, them being really excited about like, when is when will I be able to get a copy of this chapter? You know, my interviews were done in, in 2017 and, and this chapter came out in, in 2021. Um, so and, and that's not even, you know, to say anything about whether this will have policy implications or if it's landed in the right hands of somebody who can sort of implement some of the changes that I recommend in some of my other chapters. So I think that's a, some of the, you know, when somebody is vulnerable and willing to share with you something so personal for you to not necessarily have something to give back um, or to say if you can hang on in in the coming years I hope to have your story play out in a way that you know helps others um, I think that's a really big challenge Bridget Bridget you're on mute I was pressing it too many times. Um, I think a challenge research wise, but definitely in the practice space is technologies are constantly changing and perpetrator strategies are constantly changing. So it's really hard to, sometimes I think people want an exhaustive list of, of all, the, all the harms and that's just not possible. And thinking about perpetrators, what we were seeing was real world networks of perpetrators, abuser allies, but also these kind of virtual um, perpetration. And I definitely think we need more insight in that space. Uh, and I know, I think uh, Walter de Cassero is here, he's done an amazing chapter with Daniel Steinberg in, in, this, um, in this text. And he's done all this amazing work around peer support theory that I think is going to be really significant for us understanding how it works in both spaces. But we definitely, we don't know a lot about the online perpetration, I guess, especially in the domestic violence space. Yeah, totally. And um, I've actually got a question about that. I might just hold off for that for a moment. Just something that I wanted to ask you was around kind of the hierarchy of harms, which is something that's discussed in the, you know, Shandell, you look at the um, false dichotomy between the online and the offline and the, 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 the 
um, the kind of responses that you might get, whether it's at academic conferences or from policymakers or lawmakers or or from perpetrators even, um, to say that these um, aren't really serious harms, that there's not real impacts from text-based or image-based harms. I'm just wondering, have you encountered that um, with your colleagues or more broadly, um, and how do you deal with responding uh, to that um, problematic um, <laughs> viewpoint? Alison, I can see you nodding. Can I um, go to you and then, then Sinead? Sure. So I, I remember presenting at ASC uh, quite a few years ago, and I think maybe it was 2013 or so, um, and I was presenting some of my cross-cultural research that dealt with uh, dating relationships and a comparison of, of American college students and then students in Poland. And we were looking at deviant uh, behaviors, including socially interactive relational aggression. And I know that the terminology has changed a lot over time, um, but I was presenting it and there was a man in the audience and I don't know if anyone is in the room, um, potentially some individuals may have been there, but at the end, he's like, I don't understand it. Couldn't they just log off? And like, they didn't understand the implications then. And it, it reminded me of what someone said earlier. It's the same thing where people are, are excluding and closing off this whole world that we've so increasingly relied on for our interactions. And it's so frustrating that so many times um, the burden of resolving violence has been placed on, on the victims and survivors rather than perpetrating parties or even bystanders, right? So it's, um, so of course, uh, with, with hearing that, I had to try to ground myself and um, respond in an appropriate way without without getting too outraged. But I did uh, make a note that um, with times changing, there's there's a lot um, far reaching audience that a post can actually circulate among several hundred individuals, right? And even if you were to move locations, such as um, people may have done in the past, if there are victims of, of bullying, let's say, you even if you move, that can be shared anywhere you go, right? It's there for life, it reaches more people and it actually can have more devastating impacts. So um, I was glad that also I had colleagues at the conference who were supportive of, of um, the, the views and were understanding of, of how technology actually can really be detrimental in many ways, um, but we're still encountering that, right? So it takes a lot, thanks. Thanks, Alison and, and Sinead. Um, I know you've got a, a comment about that too. Yeah, I, I think that I really just to echo some of what was said there, I think that something that in the Scottish context was very important was all of the work, like I've said, that was done by Women's Aid to try and counter these narratives, that it's not serious, that it doesn't really matter, that it's not that harmful, that you can just log off. And the, the reason I wanted to chime in on that was because when that campaigning work was done, I was a young woman, um, I still think of myself as a young woman, but I was a younger woman, I was a student, um, when a lot of that campaigning work was happening. And I remember as a person, an undergraduate student, not in that academic space, um, you know, more, more than 10 years ago, seeing that campaigning work and feeling like the narrative was changing and feeling that there was, there was messaging going out, particularly on the, the Flickr site where people were parliamentarians and people in society were posting messages of support that this is something we will take seriously as a society and that we don't think it's right the sharing of like um of like revenge porn images but i think something that concerns me now a little is that campaigning work was incredible and the legislation came into place and the legislation is very very good but we don't necessarily see those prosecutions happening and sometimes i actually think now the narrative is slipping backwards and that is a concern that i have and that was partly what, what I was writing about from the Scottish context was the idea that it needs to be sustained because that narrative is so pervasive that it's just online, it's not that big a deal, or indeed you should never have taken the images in the first place. Um, and sometimes that is a, a concern that I have now, that actually that narrative is slipping and it is a crime that predominantly affects younger women. And I'm not sure that younger generation of women are getting the messaging that I got as a young woman. Um, yeah, I think that would be what I would come in to say there. Oh, um, Jane, sorry, my I did camera. I mean, my mic was doing what yours was doing before, Bridget. <laughs> sorry, Jane. No problem. 
So, so much, so many things I'd like to comment on, but I, I would like, I, I wanted to sort of pick up Sinead on what, on what you were saying, just to provide a, a recent example. So, um, uh, my colleague and co-leader of the Equality Project, Valerie Steves, just wrote a, an, a, an opinion piece about what needs to happen with Facebook um, in light of the Washington, the uh, Wall Street Journal um, investigatory report. Um, and I, I, so I was looking at the article, which is fabulous. I commend it to you. It's in the, was in the National Post. Um, but I was looking at the comments posted in relation to, in relation to the article. And the, the, the first comment was, listen, you know, if you don't like Facebook, then don't use it. Um, and so, so there is most certainly a continuing, and it continues in all spaces. So, as we work to expand people's understandings of tech facilitated violence, as yes, including acts by individual perpetrators, but also um, actions of contributing actions of corporations. Chris mentioned, you know, the afford how the affordances of technology can shape the experience or increase exposure. Um, and as we work to think about um, the role of the state in all of this and, and state perpetrated tech facilitated violence, there's so much work to be done. There continues to be that work to be done, right? Around, around convincing people that you can't build societies that effectively mandate that people be online in order to be educated, to socialize, um, to, to consume goods, to have access to information, and then use this, you know, adopt these blithe responses that say, well, if you don't like it, just sign off. That's just, it's not the reality that we, that we live in. So I share the frustration of, of so many <laughs> that I hear in, in so many voices about, and, and it really, focused on thinking about the importance of of um, of continuing to make sure, you know, being, I guess, relentless in some ways um, to, to not let to to do whatever we can to prevent the backs to prevent what I think is an inevitable um, um, backslide. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to to add that to the conversation. Well, that's a great that's great because I, that was going to be my one of my next questions was to talk about the role that you see of corporations and digital platforms, technology companies, and addressing this problem, and how you how you see that fitting alongside, as Jane has mentioned, the role of the state, but also the um, individual perpetrator who's behind, or the groups of perpetrators that are behind um, these acts. Sarai, I was wondering if Sarai, are you still there, Sarai? I am. I, I, I'm just wondering, like, would you, uh, I was going to ask, are you, do you have any comments on that? I mean, in terms, I know your, your role as a human rights lawyer and a legal researcher, how do you, how do you see the kind of the role of corporations or tech, um, technology companies or the state and, and how they might work with law enforcement or with the legal profession as well? I mean, so I have a lot of thoughts. Um, my main one for um, the perspective from Malawi is that when we think about technology facilitated violence and abuse, um, oftentimes we're targeting a much, I don't know, a higher level of technological um, engagement. In Malawi, it's mainly WhatsApp, you know? So I have been in spaces where, you know, Facebook has invited people who are working on this to talk about these issues. And I'm like, well, it isn't actually Facebook that's our problem, it's WhatsApp. Um, and sometimes the responses that we are configuring or thinking about are, are not targeting these most basic sort of groupings and communications and methods um, that people are using to violate other people's rights and privacy. Um, so we have institutions that have been set up, and I think one thing that Malawi is very good at, and I think a lot of other regional um, countries are, is developing great policies and extremely responsive legislation and so on. Um, and so it seems like we're targeting a challenge. And so we have provisions on cyber stalking, cyber bullying, cyber harassment, but in reality, it is crafted in language that doesn't respond to what's happening on the ground. So we pick and choose examples from other legislations, from other jurisdictions, 
that maybe work really well in Scotland, but are not actually targeting um, harmful messaging that's been shared on a WhatsApp group, you know? Um, and so even when you have options for takedown through organizations or institutions like MACRA, which is our um, regulatory authority when it comes to communications and, you know, similar um, take down options in Facebook or WhatsApp, but people are not using them. For one thing, we have about 4% of our population who are online. That's all together, men and women. And so even less of that is women and girls who are online. The percentage is really, really low. The messaging that Sinead may have gotten when she was you know, a student, it just isn't there at all. It simply isn't there. There are not enough organizations or people or activists who are telling um, young women how to um, respond not to avoid, because it's a lot about how to avoid this kind of violence. And that's just nonsense. This can happen to anyone, any time, any space. I've had um, women politicians talk to me about how they have been receiving dick pics when they decided to go online. It, 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 you know, it's about power, just as any form of violence against women is. Um, but how to respond to it? We don't have enough messaging about that. That. And then when you do have victims who are brave enough to blow up their entire lives and come forward and complain about their experiences, you know, the response is, well, you should have been exactly what all of you have been talking about, like, get offline. Um, you shouldn't have done this in the first place. Why would you share that kind of imagery in the, you know, when it comes right down to it? And we still have extremely conservative responses to sex and the idea that women, girls, men and boys should be able to express themselves and enjoy this online freedom just isn't there. And so all of that is responded to with vitriol. And that comes not just from private individuals, but from the police as well. So when you dare to come forward and complain, the first response is, why would you do that? This You brought this upon yourself, regardless of who or how that kind of image was shared. Um, and unfortunately, that means that whatever system you have in place cannot be is dictated by public mores and public values and public responses to, um, you know, to online um, nudity, and sexuality, and expression. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm I'm sitting here thinking, well, you know, we're still thinking about online stuff, but I'm really just like, how do we get this off of WhatsApp groups? Yeah. Uh, no, thank that, you. That was wonderful. Thank, thanks, Sarah. It was really um, interesting um, reflections there. I know, um, Shondell, you, you, you might have had a comment too about the role of digital platforms and corporations in the state and how that kind of works vis-a-vis -vis the individual and the groups that are perpetrating these harms. Um, yeah, well, Sarai raised a really good point, though, this idea that like you don't need to be online in order to experience this. Um, I, you know, the example I use when I teach this and, and make this point is often um, uh, Emma, oh, I can't remember her last name now, but an actress was like in 2014 when all of those celebrity intimate images were leaked. Um, there were some images of somebody who had their photo taken uh, without their permission or their, their awareness uh, when they were changing behind stage for um, a theatrical production they were a part of. Uh, and those images were released, right? So I think that that just sort of effectively demonstrates that, um, not that it matters, but you don't need to have been online or in a space where you can log off in the first place. Um, and so I, I think about, so when I think about digital dualism and I think about the way that we talk about online and offline life, I think about like, okay, well, where can we, where do we see this happening everywhere? But um, we, we see it happening um, amongst journalists. Uh, and I think that, that might be one particular place where we can kind of have a concerted effort to ask uh, journalists to come together and to start using more purposeful language. Um, you know, there's uh, lots of examples that I, I have collected um, over the last couple of years where headlines use language like real life or real world. Um, and I think just as, you know, The Guardian had come out saying, you know, we are purposely using the language of climate change. We're not using global warming anymore, for example, um, because they realized that the way that they talk about the problem shapes the way we treat that problem. I think that we can do the same thing um, with digital dualism. So I think that that might be one area, one institution that can kind of help us out as researchers, um, help us out as individuals impacted by this problem. Uh, would anyone else like to to comment on the question? Um, 
yeah, uh, Bridget and then Alison. So I think um, there's been, so we're so fortunate in Australia, we've got really great non-government and government agencies working in the tech plant space. And the eSafety Commissioner has been really key in driving uh, this idea about safety by design. And that's really thinking about design and development and deployment of technology as prioritising safety. And they've got principles that they've laid out, a model to be followed essentially. And really key in that, and I think key in shifting things, is that we are having more diversity in the tech spaces. You know, these don't occur in a vacuum. They reflect a lot of uh, inequalities and discrimination and marginalisation that occur. And it's about getting people in the room who have diverse experiences and can problematise how they might be targeted and affected and really speak to user practicalities. I mean, different groups use technology very differently. And so I think it's so important that we do have more diversity in the tech industry. Uh, and and that we are holding platforms to account. They they should and they can certainly be doing a lot more. Um, Alison. So I absolutely agree with um, what's been said there. And I just wanted to note that I think it's imperative that we listen to and learn from survivors of tech facilitated uh, gender violence to construct uh, not only pathways for their healing and resilience, but also, again, better spaces for everyone. And one of the challenges that I find is that um, in terms of the way that we respond to these offenses, these, these crimes, a lot of what we have um, has been hindered, particularly by um, often male dominated institutions that fail to take these uh, offenses seriously. And that involves our criminal legal system. It involves uh, tech and uh, the tech industry, right? And it involves um, areas of policing and, and more. And until we really start, I think, embracing other types of um, solutions that really center um, those who have been harmed in justice, I think we're going to kind of uh, be grappling with, with justice for individuals for a while. And we haven't really gotten there yet. So... Um, I'm hopeful we've made some progress, but at the same time, I feel like um, we, we're commonly leaving out the voices that are that matter the most, that, that should be heard the most. Thanks, Alison. And, and we'll go to Chris and then hopefully maybe Sam as well, because I'm kind of keen to hear about the dating applications as well as um, in your response. You have Sam after Chris speaks about um, porn, porn companies. So yes. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, actually, just when Alison was sharing, it, it made me think about something that came about in my research, which is particularly relevant to queer people, but also relevant to anybody who uses technology, is that when we when we tend to think about sexual violence or, or violence in general, we tend to think about this dichotomy of like a perpetrator and a victim or survivor. And so often with technology facilitated violence and abuse, there's people who are both victims and survivors as well as perpetrators. And I think that's something really important to keep in mind is that uh, these, these positions, if you will, are not static. They're quite fluid and particularly as everybody engages in these online forums or, or engages in technology in different ways. You know, somebody could be a victim one moment and a perpetrator the next, uh, which certainly complicates the process, but also speaks to the, the urgency of really addressing these issues so that uh, people stop experiencing harm and stop perpetuating harm themselves. Um, Nicola, in, in terms of your question for, for apps, um, it's really interesting to see how uh, they as companies, um, yeah, how, how they respond to their markets because the the premise of dating apps is that you connect online and, and eventually meet in person. Granted, that's not how everybody uses the apps. There's been tons of research that shows that people use them for a variety of purposes and some people just only ever interact online. But just the premise of apps uh, really situates uh, the users in a situation where they can experience technology facilitated violence by nature of interacting online and eventually meeting in person. And particularly since this is uh, facilitating interactions between complete strangers, there's there's this um, this narrative by the companies that you know you have to take care of yourself, you are responsible for yourself, and many of the panelists have spoken to that. And I think it just it again reinforces the the necessity of looking at all of the different systems rather than just putting the responsibility on the user to be responsible for themselves. We have to think about the mechanisms, the affordances, uh, how. 
uh, how law and criminology, as well as education, we haven't talked much about education, but I think there's a lot of potential for interventions, educational interventions to come in to teach young people how to use technology and how to recognize themselves in technology, how to have safe, consensual, healthy relationships with one another and themselves. Um, there's much more that I can say, but I'll, I'll turn this over to Samantha at this point. Thank you. Uh, that's wonderful. Thanks, Chris. And um, a lot that I, I think I would love to unpack with you someday <laughs> around those issues. Um, in relation to porn companies in particular, so I'm thinking about um, pornography on the internet is largely a, a duopoly in the sense that it, it's sort of dominated by two large corporations. And much of the content available on those websites isn't regulated. So up until recently, Pornhub had over 14 million videos available to view at any one time. And it was only through pressure done through online petitions around concerns about the presence of child sexual abuse material uh, on Pornhub that there was any, any steps taken to try and rectify the presence of illegal content. Um, but I think there's an awful lot to be said about the regulation of uh, by porn companies of the type of content that's presented on, on the, the front page when you arrive. So a recent study um, has just found that one in eight video titles on Pornhub constitutes sexual violence. So the behaviours that are being described are sexually violent in nature. So And those are the ones that are first given if you go to a pornography website for the first time. And in recognition of the fact that young people will often stumble online um, and come across distressing pornography that young, a lot of young people experience is distressing. I think there's a real obligation to try and shift the presence of that content. So I'm not trying to kink shame and say that that content shouldn't exist. Um, certainly some illegal content shouldn't exist, but in depictions of aggression and pornography, that's not always necessarily an issue if people do have access to holistic, comprehensive relationship and sexuality education that permits them or grants, if you like, a sense of porn literacy to be able to engage with that content themselves. But I don't think that that should be the first appearance that people will have with pornography and the first thing that they see. So I'm I'm finding it difficult at the moment with Pornhub in particular because they are trying to regulate some of their content and they have uh, introduced an extreme content policy, but essentially the policy just says um, you're, you're up to you, it's up to you, uh, you're the user, you get to decide what you look at, but Pornhub through their algorithms actually tells you what you will look at. And when we are seeing increasing levels of, say, for example, rough sexual behaviours uh, under the guise of consent, and we're seeing, you know, the presence of the rough sex defence occurring in criminal trials, um, and Pornhub itself publishes data that says that that's what women want, I think we're fueling myths around some of those existing uh, existing myths around women's sexuality in particular, and that's been what's been given to us on a plate uh, right at the beginning of engaging with that content. So education is key. And, and I, I do have some questions on education. We'll hold that thought, but we'll go to Jane and then I'm going to ask another question, then we'll move on to prevention. Yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to jump in on the, the role of platforms because we have a variety. Well, we had we we just had an election. So so there were a variety of bills in Canada relating to a number of issues, including online harms. It was a, a position paper with respect to online harms. Um, and and uh, one of the approaches relates to, you know, compelling um, platforms to uh, take greater notice um, and do a better, I suppose, do a better job of content moderation. But of course, one of the, one of the, you know, I feel like this is such a complicated issue because, you know, at the same time, we have that Wall Street Journal um, uh, investig investigation, which didn't come as a surprise to anybody. It just it just reaffirmed that there was internal research that matched a lot of external research that was already there. But but then to to sort of say, you know, the the legis the regulatory response is going to be to say once again, corporations, um, you take care of it, and then we'll just monitor to see how you're doing. Um, makes me very nervous. I, I'm not sure these are the organizations that I 
In fact, I'm quite confident these are not the organizations that I trust to be making these decisions with it without um, some kind of greater public or community based um, parameters on what on what needs to be happening. And, and so I, I just wanted to sort of get that get that um, out there as well, because that, of course, pressure is mounting, especially in, in really in rightly so in relation to child sexual abuse images. Um, uh, and and I just want to make, you know, the concern is that we don't rush to um, solutions that actually re embed the the, you know, just deepen the power that these um, large tech conglomerates actually have over us in our daily interactions and, and discourse. Yeah, that, that's a, a really great point. Thanks, Jane. <clears throat> I want to just, um, with my next question, move to talking about law because it's something I feel like most researchers in this space tend to agree that we need to have you know, new specific legislation to address the harms associated with image-based sexual abuse, with online rape threats, doxing, and so on and so forth. But there's also recognition from those same researchers, including myself, that the, the criminal pathway is very fraught, particularly for people who've had experiences um, of, you know, intimate images, for example, being distributed or any kind of like sexual related um, harms. So I'm wondering if we could, um, maybe if we could start with Sinead and Sarai, given your work in the legal sphere, what your thoughts are on a kind of carceral approach to dealing with this issue, whether you think um, there are some issues there and, and um, how we might kind of address some of those problems. It, it's so interesting, I think, sometimes being in this space as, as lawyers, because you have this inherent belief that law is is, is a good thing, is a good solution, it feels like a good tool. And then in this space, actually often, that's not what we see is particularly when you work in, in sexual violence work, you're aware that the existing law is not doing the job that it ought to be with crimes that we, you know, that aren't internet based. Um, and it's difficult because when Sarai and I first started talking before this, this chapter was ever conceived of when we first started talking about this issue in like, I don't know when that would have been, sorry, like 2016 or 17, um, because Sarai's published on this before. And when we were talking about it originally, I said, oh, you know, Scotland's recently brought in this piece of legislation. It's really good. And, and our initial standpoint was, oh, wonder what we could learn from each other. And maybe there could be a similar campaign in Malawi for similar kind of legislation. And that was where that conversation started from. And Sarai, I'll let you come in on that, because I think quite quickly we got to a space of, law is only as good as the culture which is implementing that law and, and it's very easy to create a paper tiger um, in this space and I think that yeah I'll hand over to you because you're much more eloquent on this than me but but that was our thinking wasn't it? That was exactly what we were thinking yeah. and um, it's like I said earlier where we have so many pieces of legislation so many policies responding to so many things but it depends upon how or whether people are really able to um, utilize um, the promise of the law uh, and see some sort of real-time responses to perpetrators of this kind of violence. Um, you know, do people actually face any kind of um, repercussions for, for these kinds of actions? And the reality is that no, they don't. And so you have a law that looks really great, that sounds really good, and then the person who ends up facing fines or jail time is somebody who said that the first lady looks like a chameleon, as yeah. opposed to um, a young man who posted the phone numbers of over 100 students. And I think earlier when we were talking about um, what survivors experience and so on, I wanted to add that one of the things is that a lot of them, uh, a lot of women and girls then get tasked with the responsibility for the life of this perpetrator and so do you want to res be responsible for him no longer being able to go to school do you want to be the reason why he gets thrown out of university why he no longer has a future and on top of just wanting to be forgotten that's something else that they have to have as a burden on them and the law is not a response to that the law doesn't offer um certainly not the criminal law perhaps in civil actions or civil suits you might have some kind of 
um, retribution, some kind of uh, an apology, something that hurts uh, the pocket or somewhere like that. But the criminal justice system is just about whether or not somebody gets to serve jail time. And nobody really wants that for their perpetrator. They want to A, be forgotten, to have that sort of content taken down and perhaps to be, you know, to get an apology. Um, and the criminal justice system doesn't really offer that to survivors. And so the law, yes, like Sinead said, as lawyers, we want to believe in the power of the law. And I think certainly countries like Malawi almost fetishize, fetish the power of the law. It, it, it's something like, you know, if we have a problem, we need a law to solve it. But in mm. reality, there's only so far that the law goes. Um, and I think that this is one space where that really, really shows up. Yeah, yeah. over. I, I think in Scotland, it's interesting as well, because when we brought in the law, when we did the consultation, whether we should have it, 99% of respondents said that we should. And a discussion that Sarai and I had at the time was if we did a similar consultation in Malawi without all of the women's activism that went on to get us to a point in time where people really supported that, would we get a 99% response rate? You know, would the Gender and Justice Unit get a 99% response rate? Yes, we need this bespoke IBSA offence. And I think our feeling was, I don't, I don't think so. And I think that that can be, law can be so attractive. New legislation can be so attractive. And I'm from a country where we've only had a parliament, a devolved parliament um, since since the early 2000s. And we do fetishise law and, and like making legislation. And I think you have to be quite careful about when you do that, because you can very easily disappoint survivors by creating a piece of legislation that is a paper tiger. That doesn't seem to be the case in Scotland, although numbers aren't necessarily what we would hope that they would be. That might just be kind of like a bedding in. Um, um, yeah, the, 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 we're hoping that that will improve. and. There's been really good work going on with like the police to try and to try and improve detection le levels, but um, but yeah, I think it's easy to fetishize law as lawyers, and I think Sarah and I started from a place where we did that a little bit, and then quite quickly realized that actually that maybe wasn't the best solution um, in these cases in particular. Um. Thank, thank you so much. That really helpful um, insights. We've got about five minutes. I just want to um, remind the audience again, if you're wanting to ask a question, feel free to put it in the chat or to put your hand up. We have a comment from Andrea. Thanks, Andrea, in the audience who said, thank you to all presenters for your courage and contributions. Absolutely love hearing voices from around the globe, noting the commonality of behaviour and challenges across discovery experience. I hope there are future opportunities to spend time together like this. Um, I just have a question. There's another question that's come up, but I just want to ask it before we run out of time, which is about the important question about prevention. Um, I'm just wondering if we could have some quick reflections from the presenters about what you see are the, the most important things we should doing we should be doing around prevention. Then I'll move to Samantha's question in the in the audience. Jen? Yeah, so so I guess I've been, um, I have enough gray hair that um, I actually don't have, despite being a lawyer and legally trained, I've actually stopped really thinking of law as a solution to much of anything, um, which is a little disappointing considering I could, I've, I've uh, committed a career to it. But that being said, um, I, I do think sometimes there is something to be said for law's expressive value. And the problem and the problem is, I find, is that what happens is it passing a law is e becomes is almost easy. And then people just stop. And they're like, well, we dealt with that because we passed this piece of legislation. Right. And we don't go on to do the work to sort of say, well, no, this is just this is like. This is harms reduction until we figure out how we fix society, right? Um, and that's why I think, and I think education is a huge, a huge part of that. Um, and I think it's also really important. And I, I love this, the nuance in in Sinead and, and Sarai's chapter on this, right? Which is, which sort of looks at the fact that um, uh, we you, we can't we 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 need to be cognizant of the fact that there are groups in society against whom criminal law has been used as a as as a form of violence and so to 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 depict a criminal legal response 
as a as a response that members of marginalized communities would want to use um, is it is a massive problem. So that for me, I think I think you know, and I I heard I just heard a sexual violence panel not in the context of tech facilitated violence where people were saying the same thing. We we have to start young, we have to start early, and we have to have um, we have to have informed sex education. Um, we have to inform young people about their rights and stop telling them what it is that they're they have to do. You've got to do this. You've got to stop doing that. Like those to me, like that's the that's the possibility of transformational change. That's where it lies. It it isn't it isn't really with law. Chris, can I jump in there? Yeah. So. Um... Jane, my background and career path is is centered around education, and so my topics have changed. But I'm I'm passionate about education, and I see it as as certainly a way to to mobilize change. Um, it's not to say it's without its own flaws, but just uh, education as an institution. But education as an idea, I believe very much so in. Um, and certainly, when we think around sex and sexuality, I think there's so much uh, untapped potential for how young people oh, and people of any age truly can can be freed from uh, these kind of constraints around uh, technology facilitated sexuality you know and i think there's so much that um you know it, it what comes to mind actually samantha when you were speaking uh was how much we've seen uh the response uh with pornography and only fans in particular during the pandemic is pre-pandemic it was it was viewed as you know this kind of like hush hush bad thing like why would you engage in porn if you can do something in real life and yet uh during lockdown you know for many people that was like the only way that they could uh engage in some form of sexual activity and so and it's it's well known you know again samantha you were talking about what four billion videos or something or i forget what the statistic was specifically but you know there's so many people who engage in sexuality uh engage in their sexuality online or facilitated through technology and rather than demonizing it or villainizing it i think we need to embrace it um in many ways that can truly free people and liberate people to enjoy uh to enjoy it for themselves and then to enjoy it with other people or, or to just even talk about it more openly. Um, so that's one thing that I would like to see uh, through a sex education and even interpersonal conversation. You know, I think we can do a lot more to normalize uh, technology facilitated sexuality. Yes. Um, and, and Samantha, I know there's a, the, the advertisement in New Zealand about um, the, the porn stars that knock on the door of the um, the mum, and uh, I'm, I'm actually, sorry, just really quickly, just curious about what your thoughts are on, on has anyone else seen that advertisement? It's like uh, a consent, you know, pornography, young person, sorry, Sam, you, you, you know more about it than I do. Yeah, so it, it was built um, through, uh, through conversations with multiple government agencies and uh, sex educators uh, around how we can destigmatize conversations between adults and young people about pornography and encourage them to have critical conversations about that. Uh, it depicts it in a jovial and humorous way, uh, some very stereotypical looking porn stars, if you like, turn up at the front door, mum answers, son is terrified, and mum says it's time for us to have a chat about what you're doing online. Um, and I think it, it, I mean, it went viral, it's been fantastic, and I think it's um, a really great step in opening up some of those really challenging conversations um, and reducing some of the stigma around talking about pornography, given uh, how much it does um, form a, a healthy and normative part of many people's sexuality. Um, but at the same time, I think I'd like to see pornography as an embedded part of uh, sex and relationships education. Uh, we know that, that in Aotearoa in particular has been inconsistently delivered across the country. Uh, so, And it's also not compulsory um, to participate in sex and relationships education. So I'd like to see that um, be given uh, to all young people uh, and for it to be focused around pleasure, but also around asking about their values in relation to sex and and pornography in particular. So how can we question what we're seeing and how do we navigate um, through this, this new online world we live in? 
Thank, thank you. I, um, I, I feel terrible because I know Samantha in the chat has asked a question. Um, I'll just read it out and maybe if the presenters could respond to her while Jane's wrapping up because we really do need to wrap up. Um, but Samantha said, super important conversations to be had around accountability versus punishment. Wondering about how models like circles of support and accountability can be applied to technology facilitated abuse. Thank you for your work on this. Um, so if, if the presenters are happy to kind of give a bit of a comment to Samantha and apologies, Samantha, that we've run out of time. I thought we had so much time up our sleeves um, but passing on to Jane um, to do the closing but I just wanted to thank the presenters so much for such a wonderful discussion um, today and, and thank you um, thank you so much thank you Nicola and, and thanks to um, all of the authors who spoke today all of the authors in the in the book who, who were with us and those who weren't able to be with us I want to thank Katie um, Mathers and the rest of the team at Emerald Publishing I want to thank the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council for funding the Equality Project, which was foundational to completion of this volume. Um, I want to thank the RAs who were crucial to the work that was done, Taylor Bain, Jasmine Dong, Stephanie Vasile, Alice Witt, um, and also to Robert Porter, who was the Equality Project manager um, who, who shepherded us through many aspects of the publication process. Um, and last but not least, of course, I want to thank uh, my uh, co-editors, Nicola and Asher, um, and my unbelievably supportive and patient family and a very kick-ass group of feminist friends and colleagues who supported me through the process of seeing this book through to publication um, that brings us here. Thank you to our audience. Thanks to everyone for being here. Please look up the book when you have time. Um, let's look for opportunities to continue these uh, to continue these conversations um, and uh, take care, everybody. Um, we're in precarious times and it's really important to take care of ourselves. So thank you. Uh, and thank you to Florian and, and Justin for all the work CLTS did to to get this organized. Um, goodbye, everybody. Still, let's stay in touch.